private companies. So what type of war are we speaking here today? So we're speaking about um, what type of wars do rest of the rest of the countries fight today? We do fight against terror. The United States and Iran, it's in, against ISIS, it's against uh, Hezbollah, it's against Hamas. But what's unique about wars against terrorists? That they're fighting from inside society, from inside um, societies who have nothing to do with the war, which are innocent, and we want to try not to harm them as we can. And the problem is, is the thoughts. The international law says we can harm um, um, people, uh, society, uh, people who are not part of the war as long as it's proportional into the gain we make in the war. And meaning such a law, when that's international war, we say a law, we, each one has a huge place for interpretation. For example, what happens when we have a gen, uh, the general of the terror organization in the house, but he has another 100 children around him? What happens when it's 50? What happens in international war is not specific. And, and, and therefore we say, when, since, what, um, what things we say that we want, that, and since we say, and so what, also what's unique about this virus, that, um, not now, that each individual can have a lot of influence. Why? Because who decides if to bomb this apartment at this time? You don't have a long time to decide, well, 20 kids, one general, it has to be a quick decision. You don't have time to go back. And there was a, each individual could have a lot of impact, especially when he has to come into his decision. And therefore, we see if we get the word people into the battlefield who make um, um, decisions that do not support what we want, which will be decisions that poor people will die, will make decisions that war will continue on, and we lose the, 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 the confidence of society, we are, um, we are making the battlefield place a much bloodier place, which will last longer. Yes? National armies, with their incentive to uh, minimize their own body count, are likely to use tactics like drone strikes and heavy bombing that massively increases collateral damage. Why are PMCs worse? Well, okay, so let me second point. So what are the difference between the armies and private companies? We say there are a couple of differences. Number one, because why we could uh, acknowledge that well, some people who come to the army are not, um, they might do it because of um, their social um, uh, position. We see People who go to the private sector, they decided to go to the private and not to the army. What does it mean as a person when you decide to go to the private and not to the army? It means between those places, I prefer money than ideology, because the private companies pay more money, but there's no ideology behind. There's no, Amer uh, there's no America, there's no France, there's no country behind. This, all it is is about money. And therefore we see, between those people, we prefer the people with the money, but who prefer who have somewhat of a, you know, more uh, uh, ideology than money. And therefore we see, uh, Money. But why is money for people who are interested in money so critical for this debate? Because what is the interest of someone who has money? And when does he get money? Only when the government asks him to come to war. What will happen the day the war is over? He is going to lose his brand because the government will not want him anymore. So when his interest is to continue on the war. His interest is that the, the war should go on. But on the other hand, someone who so has the ideology, he is interested for the war to end. Why? Because he is going to get the public support, which he is going to army. He's going to be rid of the money depending on how good the war came out. Did the war had good influence on the bad influence on society? And therefore we say, this is critical. If I'm here for money, or I came to you, which I chose between both, I, cho cho I went, chose to ideology and more money. Okay. But more than that, the army, we have control them before they come to the war. We teach them ethics. We teach them the what's important, the beauty of the, the importance of life. And therefore, we say we're getting much more people with personal ethics. And personal ethics is very important because, as I explained, when you're fighting terrorists, this is the war. It's one man decision when to attack. If ten people are enough to stop this attack, but not. And therefore, this is so um, critical. But we say even more. Uh, 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 um, more than someone from the U.S. Army feels that he's representing someone. He feels he has um, 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 he has um, responsibility, and with responsibility, you believe you do go much more um, 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 further. Uh, with responsibility, I'm going to get the best decisions because I feel like I represent one. And we see even the, the, um, uh, another big difference because let's talk about the commander, uh, the commander, the commander in these armies. Because why was why in the while in the in the in, in the army, the commander will be rewarded when the war comes out good, 
when Poseidon will say, you went and did a job, came out, he has, and the command is having very big interest to end the war. On the other hand, when we went back, these people want to make more money and continue, and continue, continue, the, war, uh, continue the war. And how do they do it? So we, one way we spoke about is by, by, by making decisions which aren't, um, which aren't so great. And they, they can do it, because why can't they do it? Because I have explained, in these wars, it's a very great area. You could take steps which are very unclear, and you couldn't make a big difference. And it's very hard to investigate, because Go prove how many people are exactly inside, or what is the influence and the proportional in this case. And therefore, we say it's very hard to investigate. And therefore, we say in the army, we have more investigation also. Why do we have more investigation in the army? Because the army, we have a hierarchy. We have people with a, a commander, people behind them, under him, and more people under him. And therefore, we say in the army, while someone's going to come and report about his friend, he will be accepted because that's the way the army works. People, with, um, when they report, we could. Um, 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 uh, we could get them um, bonuses because we you know was official reports. On the other hand, over here, just one person in top of this private company, and all the rest is just one big uh, part of people who are not interested in reporting because ethics mean nothing to them but money. And therefore, the end of the day, what are we saying here? Since war is a place where there's a lot of your individual to make the decision, it's a very great area where a decision could be crucial. It could be crucial by killing people, but more than that, by changing the public's opinion. Because while they, the, the, the private will be harsh towards the public, they will decide. Society over there, speaking of, in exact their reactions over there, and it will be more um, harmful to them. Or again, the agenda continue on with other connections. So the bottom line, in order to stop the war to being too long and unnecessary, in order to have less than people, and in order for have the uh, the uh, right decision made in the war, we ask you to propose. Thank you. Thank that speaker for their comments and call on the leader of the opposition to open the case of the opposition. Give me one second, my timer is behaving. Honorable panel, in the mid-2000s, the US military attempted to take the life of Osama bin Laden through a drone strike. They targeted an innocent civilian on the basis that he was, one, Arabic-looking, and secondly, over six foot tall. Okay? That he was described as a legitimate target. That was the language that was used in this case. Not, we done goofed and killed a civilian, he was a legitimate target. That is the problem with state militaries. That is why PMCs are much more effective often than ground troops. Two pieces of a, a two, three things for you. Firstly, accountability with a comparative. Secondly, effectiveness. Thirdly, what happens in their alternative units. A few points of, uh, of rebuttal that don't fit in. First, this idea that people join the army because of patriotism and balance. Probably not, right? The majority of people who join the military join the military because they feel like they often have no other choice, right? It's just fundamentally untrue that that's a thing. Secondly, we also find that the majority of individuals who work within PMCs have past military experience within these very bodies, right? So in the sense that like, they are the same people to some extent, we think that, uh, uh, that, that the, the idea that they have no values is wrong. We think it's very easy in this debate for proposition to say, if you look at the latest war game video where PMCs are seen as awful and may as well be called kitten strangulars PMC. We think it's very easy for them to take that very one-sided analysis, probably not realistic in the real world. Second, incentives to elongate conflicts, right? But on the, on the ground, probably not, right? Each individual like worker for the PMC is likely not going to elongate the war in order to get more money because assuming he gets paid by the same corporation on the same basis that most military individuals do. Secondly, if you're talking about commanders and, and the PMC itself making an executive decision to elongate the war, we don't see how that's any different 
Ireland to commanders within state militaries doing the same thing in order to lobby for more state funding so that they can afford more um, military hardware, right? We don't think that they've acknowledged the comparison. Thirdly, th they say it's easier to do things when there's a hierarchy, uh, which there is in the military. One, we think there's a hierarchy in PMCs. We think that PMCs have commanders as well. Secondly, we think PMCs often swap it at supplement uh, the, 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 the military itself, at which point it slots into this hierarchy system, like, just no comparison. Firstly, then, onto accountability. No, thank you. I've not started my case yet, I've just revised it. Um, accountability, right. Firstly, of PMCs, right. We think that, like, what we'd like to see in reality is a well-regulated uh, market for PMCs. We think the best way to do this isn't to stop all PMCs being employed by the West. Not get rid of PMCs, that's not the motion. But uh, stop Western nations from using PMCs. We think that what PMCs are profit driven at the point at which, and they're correct to say that now warfare is now is now based against terrorist terrorist cells with, within communities, right? PMCs have to compete with one another. You do not compete with other PMCs to make yourself valuable to seem valuable to the US by saying we're really good at killing civilians, right? You have to prove that you're very good at killing targets and not civilians, right? We think that that's really important, right? So at the point at which P individual PMCs are competing on who is best at not killing civilians, we think that's a better world than one in which they live. Because there is this competition, right, on these factors. Second, secondly, uh, notice that this doesn't exist in the status quo because excuses are often made. He's very correct to say that war is often a grey area, right? It's to do with interpretation. But the very nationalism that he says is a good thing acts as a bad thing, right? Because we incentively feel like we owe the military who protect us a, a duty, right? We're willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. That doesn't exist. Oh, amongst PMCs, right? Notice that like excuses in that you need it's necessary to save lives becomes far less able to be made when it's a PMC, right? It's very easy to say for the American American military to say we did this in order to save the most servicemen's lives because that's what's most important to us and get applauded by the populace. It's far more difficult for a PMC to set that up as their metric because the American public doesn't innately care about the lives of per, per private military com, co, uh, contractors as much as they do their own military. Right? Notice that, like, also, you're more, you get a higher incentive for government to cut, to semi cover up atrocities that occur. Right? At the point at which, one, America is actually completely unable to tell how many individuals it has killed with drone strikes. That's horrific. Secondly, at the point at which the definition of a combatant in within drone strikes uh, is a um, an, a a a, middle, a combat aged male. That's really damaging, right? At the point at which the only civilian casualties which the government counts are women and children. That's really harmful. Notice that they don't have the same incentive to cover their own asses when it's to do with PMCs, right? That's really important. They fail on that comparison. Secondly, not only do we get accountability, I'll take you in a second, of, of, of the um, PMC in itself, but also individual soldiers, right? Because it's just factually true that, um, that the hierarchy that these guys talk about when they say, oh, it's fine because there's a hierarchy to enforce this. Superior officers all, all often find, see their soldiers as my boys, right? My boys in combat is a common phrase that you hear. That, sort, that doesn't exist within the employer-employee relationship that occurs within a PNC, right? Go. I thought I killed dozens of innocent civilians who didn't even think were Osama bin Laden. Brilliant. Why, why but, yeah, yeah, brilliant. Right. What? We don't have to defend bad PNCs that exist. We have to, like, no, we don't. Like, Reasons why past examples that they may bring up don't count. One, we think that like a warfare has changed to the point at which there's terrorist cells and America is feeling less nationalistic, more interested in civilian casualties than it was in the past, right? Because it has realized how damaging civilian casualties are because of what happened with Blackwater. Secondly, we also find that there is now a more expansive um, PMC, um, like, um, economy, I guess, is the way you'd phrase it, at which point there's more ability to have competition which didn't exist in the past. That's why that is a non-analogous example. On to effectiveness then. One, we think that PMCs often have specific skills within regions, right? At the point at which, like, PMCs can base themselves within Africa and have specific knowledge of, re of a specific region, then they are able to fight more effectively in that region. Notice that governments are unable to have resources uh, 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 that, that create specialists of the same level who are specialised within these regions. 
notice that makes them a more effective fighting force, but also more effective at not killing civilians. Secondly, we think that there's less emotional investment, right? I've already said how governments often make excuses for their what soldiers, but like there's the but the point at which like you're not so angry about 9-11 that you want to kill everyone who looks slightly Muslim, that's really important for getting effective war play. I've shown you why there's no accountability or much worse accountability in the military. They have to respond. Proud to propose. Oppose. <laughs> I don't think it's a huge surprise that we're okay with our day-to-day -day knowledge of how military expeditions work and how the army works and how the war works over here in Team Israel. We think we've got quite a lot of experience in that area, and you know, and that's something that we're that we're okay with. However, the thing that we want to be talking about here is how this affects people, both on the individual level and how this affects the big decisions that are being made. And this is something that we think isn't properly understood completely by this side, and perhaps that's why it didn't engage with everything that Dolly is talking about. So what we're going to be, what I'm going to be looking at is a kind of how the big decisions get made, and really do the comparative, uh, do the comparative between the army and between private companies, because obviously we accept the fact that both the army makes mistakes and private company makes mistakes. And the question that Dolly posed was, who is less likely to make these kinds of mistakes? Who is more likely? Who has more natural incentive to perpetuate a war? Is it the military, or is it the CEO of a company with shareholders? These are the kind of questions that we want to be looking at. And then we want to be looking at the individual people inside the war. And again, we want to be asking ourselves, we accept completely that military people make bad decisions as well, and individual decisions. What we asked them to do was to take a greater look at who the individual people in the field are, I'm sorry, who the individual people in the field are, and who is more likely to make a less good decision when coming. And this is something that we don't really feel that they were able to do. So let's look at the big decisions first. Because the most important thing is that this motion is essentially talking about people inside combat areas, right? This is talking about boots on the ground kind of things, and that's what the motion is going for. So stuff like drone strikes and stuff like that, these are decisions which aren't made by the private companies. The decisions which are made by the government, made by the government, the private companies don't have access to drones to make the decision in order to have a drone strike. So we think that kind of comparison isn't really relevant to the debate at hand. We think the kind of big decisions that are relevant to the to the to the debate at hand is kind of the question of what is sort of the what is the uh, what is the spirit uh, spirit in, uh, de corps of the people? No, thank you. Which they get from their leadership, because what we say here is that the military is under is directly accountable is accountable to the government and to the people of who of who is serving. So we say that they necessarily have to serve. Sorry, have to, have to are serving that interest. We accept that there are a lot of foreign interests that come into play as well and lead to some wonky decision making. But that's certainly part of their decision making process, and they are judged at the end of the day by the people, essentially by is the war, how does the war, is the war going to be ended, because they don't want necessarily more American soldiers in the field, and how effective it was at, say, combating terrorism and everything else. That's how we judge kind of the military on. Now, on the other hand, the people, these private companies, guys, really nice, these private companies, uh, the CEO, the CEO is accountable to who? To his shareholders. That means he's, he's looking at a much more short-term bottom line. Essentially, these private companies can't exist if yeah, they sorry. over a few. No, thank you. If over a few quarters, they don't make a profit. Especially exactly because of the competitive nature that they're talking about, they will simply be replaced. Because essentially, they will simply be replaced because they're not making a profit, and therefore their shareholders, their shareholders will pull out and invest their money elsewhere. And there we say, no thank you, we have, a, we have a problem that the people here, people in charge, kind of have a want and a need for the war to continue, for the combat to continue. And that's kind of the that's kind of decision that we get made there. And then the other thing we say is, is that when we come to look and do overview of these big decisions, so yes, there's obviously a naturalistic impulse to protect the military. However, we say that the average citizen is unable to distinguish between, say, the MPC and the military when it comes to the national pride issue, and they are equally likely to protect them, as is the military, by the way, because the military also knows that the buck stops with them, and they find it in the military also always go with, no thanks guys, comes in defense of these NPCs and protects them as well as part of the protection that they're doing. 
So we don't really get kind of this cloud cover that they're trying to sort of talk about here. But what we do say at the end of the day is that the military has better mechanisms for dealing with it inside, no, sorry guys, inside, inside what, what comes out there. And what we say is the mechanisms that they, that they can use, the things which are important to them, again, because of this spirit of court, is to have the ability for the soldiers to come up and complain and say things are going wrong. And then for them to look into that, again, because they're held accountable at the end of the day, no thank you, for what for what's been happening, as opposed to these private companies where this thing doesn't really exist. So that's the real problem that we have here. And that's why we find this case doesn't quite mesh with the big decisions being made. I'll take a second hand. If your case is true that the buck stops with the army and the army is effective at regulating things, why can't they just exert more control over the PMCs and make them better? Okay, thanks. So A, we say that because, because of PMCs, uh, we say uh, A, the army isn't amazing at doing it. We're saying they're better at doing it than, than the other people, which is why we want inside the military there be as few grey areas possible. We say B, and this is something that Don talked about, the moment you come in and have a private organisation with their own rules, with their own, with their, with their own rules, their own business, who aren't accountable under court martial law, and aren't accountable to, the, to everything that the military is accountable to, then, it, then we make that government's job that bit much more harder to do a, to, to do a, to make decisions which were already pretty complicated to begin with. And then we look at the individual level, the individual people, because this is what was completely missed here. We accept the fact that the individual per, that the, a lot of the individual people on the ground won't necessarily want to kill people for the sake of it. That's not necessarily what we're saying here. We're saying that the individual people who at the end of the, who don't have the same they don't have the same ethical training the same ethical backing of the people who are, who are going who are going into these people who are also coming who are coming from a place where they want to where, where they need to where they want to earn, uh, earn money and whose lives and who don't feel accountable and responsible for the American military or the American population these are people who are more likely to make individual decisions which have a bigger impact on the local population these are the people who are more likely in an incredibly dangerous scenario which these things happen all the time. Say, you're going, you have to go, a commander has to try to go into a booby-trapped house. Do they just blow up the house? Or do they have to, do they try and send people in to disengage the different bombs that are going on? These are the kind of decisions that need the commander to make on a day-to-day -day basis. And we say that the individuals inside these companies are essentially much worse off and making these decisions and dealing with these decisions. And that's when we get the perpetuation of the war. Not necessarily because there is they want to do it on every single person on an individual level, but because they make the wrong decisions, because they, they burn out the support the military has of the local communities, which is imperative if you want to win, and because they create all these bad images of America and other countries around the world, then we get necessarily people who are making bad decisions and doing wrong things. So at the end of the day, we say that both on a high up level and on the individual level, back down in the field, we want the person to make the best possible decision at the end of the day. And because it's so difficult in hindsight to come and prove this, we need to have the best people on the ground to begin with. And we don't think the military is perfect, but we think they're a damn bit better than private companies. Thank you very much. Soldiers, you know, they don't hire people from the age of 17 and train them like the army does. So, if ethical training is so good on their side, then it's good on our side. Great. Secondly, they say, actually, we think money is probably a better way. Is for people they say, oh, mercenaries only want money. Now, if I tell a mercenary, go in, achieve this objective, don't don't kill civilians. We don't want you to do that thing. If you do that thing, we will probably not pay you as much. We will punish you, or we will not hire you in the future. That is a better. Like, that is a better motivation than do this for the God-given right of America to exist. Do this because you're saving our people. Do this because, like, for the love of your country. It's probably better to have a nice, clear, do this thing and you don't get paid. That's actually a better objective. We think that's a win on our side. 
A couple of reasons. They say the military account building. One, we're perfectly happy for the military to crack down. We don't mind holding them to the military account. We don't think that's happening. Secondly, we notice mil PMCs don't exist independently of the military. They supplement the military, but they are not out there making decisions. They don't just hire PMCs, send them into a country, go crazy about it, do this thing. It's like they're almost always acting within a larger command structure. They'll probably be more military and PMCs on the ground. As such, we think that same thing applies. Second, we think these are uh, people are um, uh, they're only accountable for shareholders. That's really bad. The problem is the military are accountable to politicians and voters. We would say shareholders are better at are actually better at taking that long-term view of if we commit atrocities or see as a company that commits atrocities and does not do things effectively. As we point out, we don't have to defend Blackwater. We can still say we want a better regulated market. Then at that point, shareholders are more likely to make the right decision and say, please stop doing these things or we need to act in a certain way that is more befitting on our company. In a way that is difficult, because they say you don't get this cloud cover. The problem is you see it every day. Any time an American soldier commits a, commits a war crime, there's always right-wing politicians standing up and saying, no, we need to do these things. These things are important. How dare you offend our military? There's a huge cult of person, uh, cult personality, the uh, cult of thing around the military. People see them as a huge important thing that is not open to criticism, that is hard to criticize. If you criticize, you are not picked up. And it's PMCs just don't, like, it's true that most people probably don't care about like American so uh, PMCs in America, they don't care about say PMCs hired from, I don't know, North Africa or like France than they do about say Americans. Like it's just true that people don't carry that same emotional connection. So there is likely to be that different sense of accountability. It's easier to hold PMCs to account. Right. And then finally they talk about we think this actually a debate probably happens on the home front as much as it does in the board. We think we're gonna win on that ground as well though, because the kind of actually yeah, the kind of interventions you had their side, they say we talked about the body bag attack. We say you don't get the kind of interventions that we want on our side. Because good interventions are harder to do. People are afraid that their own soldiers are going to die. So what happens with PMCs? It's easier to commit good interventions. Good interventions exist. There are probably times it's good to send in military, but hard to do because of the political pressure. That doesn't exist when you PMCs. But notice, they say PMCs don't have drones. That's the point. Because on their side, because you cannot send in ground troops, because you cannot commit the political will to sending in ground troops, you are forced to use much less exact methods, like drones, like Bombings from a high distance, which more likely lead civilian casualties. PMCs on the ground will always be thrown warfare. But the problem is, right now, the political will exists. We think that we need the political will to exist in higher PMCs because then you're less likely to get the bad drone warfare. That's easier for politicians to justify to voters. Everyone wins in that scenario. Right. First point. Uh, the, like the, well, I kind of talked about this way, but the body guard effect, we say, look, some interventions are important. You get intervention at the point which we need to commit these interventions, it is difficult to get the political will from. We think it's just valuable to have this resource. Secondly, though, this goes into the effectiveness point, and my partner's talk about I'm going to talk about that a bit more. So, one, PMCs aren't just all American corporations, right? But they're probably PMCs that exist specifically in regions such as the Middle East, such as Africa, such as in like Southern Africa. Now, we think those people are also probably incredibly useful to have around. We think the military simply cannot maintain everyone in every position. They cannot maintain everyone who speaks Pashtun or whatever in one who, who speaks a specific language in a specific unit. They cannot maintain the same level of things. We think PMCs are incredibly useful at filling in the gaps the military can because the military doesn't have complete resources, because the military is under political pressure. Notice that almost the military budget in almost every Western nation at the moment is on the way down. People don't want to spend as much on the military, they want to cut, they want to cut. As such, PMCs allow those skills to continue to exist and provide effectiveness. And that's better on both sides, because that means, hey, those people, for example, if you're using local PMCs, they're much more likely to interact with the people on a local level, provide useful intel, like this is a place in which people might commit, commit ambush. This village is more in favor of this thing and that thing. Those people know things that simply, a foreign body simply coming in cannot know and will not be able to find out because they're seen as invaders in a way that a local PMC might not be seen. We think that's incredibly valuable. But more generally, we think it's also just on, on the effectiveness, just generally, if, you're, if you know those things, you have specific skills, you have engineers and you didn't have any in that place, you're likely to leave less deaths on both sides at the point where they're more effective unit. PMCs fill in the gaps of normal militaries, can't just normal militaries are obviously stressed, they're obviously under huge pressures, they're obviously under political pressures. So it's difficult for those normal militaries to have the right people in the right places, given that most Western militaries at this point are engaged in often two, three or more interventions or UN or bodies in, in different ways. I think that's generally a good thing. We also know it's better in long-term interventions, because if you need people to spend, say, five to ten years in a place, you need peace for peacekeeping missions or to keep the peace as opposed to an active ground, to keep so on the ground but not on an active fighting role. We think it's much harder to justify that politically, because people say, why are we spending all our money keeping our boys out there? People say, why has my son not come home from, let's say, Sierra Leone for the last five years? I want him back. People start complaining, and it's easy for politi other politicians to use that as a stick to say, right, we'll bring them back. So the point of PMCs, again, there's not that buy-in from the people. People don't care if you've got PMCs out there, you're spending some money on them. Just doesn't have, just doesn't stop. You get your interventions to last exactly as long as the state needs them to last, as opposed to for that. And this goes in, and then finally the comparative. 
So first, a couple of things. We've already pointed out why we think PMCs are likely to make as good choices. Also, note that they keep saying PMCs can just continue a war. I mean, how? What are they saying? One, PMCs are people. People don't like spending time in war zones. If I'm a, a, a specific PMC company, I'm not going to be like, oh yeah, I'm happy to spend my time sitting out in the middle of Iraq getting shot at by ISIS. They probably want to be done as much as anyone else because their families and lives and the things that they like to do that getting shot probably doesn't involve. Two, how do you do that? Like, how do you continue a war? They're just saying PMCs are just going to go off and like, you know, there's a peace settlement of ISIS, and then they suddenly go off and just shoot some people to start it again. Like, that's the kind of thing that A, probably stops you getting paid, but also B, just doesn't fit into the incentive structures, or if it does, it fits into the same incentive structures for the military. So the PMT aren't going to be able, or more likely willing, to just randomly continue a war. They want to get paid. We can also just pay them on targets. We're not paying them hourly. We're not like, you get 20 quid an hour for every hour you spend in Iraq. We'll probably say something like, commit, finish this target, kill this target, or secure this village. You know, to guard this village, whatever. We're probably not going to just pay them by the day. So we don't think PMTs have the ability or the incentive to just continue wars at random. We're not even sure how that works beyond action that would probably get them stop from getting paid. And the comparative is that these PMCs will probably just get hired by someone else. We are talking about Western states. To the extent that they will still exist, we think it's better they say in our market where we can regulate, where we can have an action in good ways, as opposed to when they're bought by countries we are not crazy about, who will act in ways we're not crazy about. Because of those three points, I'm very proud to oppose. Fine, the proposition branch don't want to defend black water in this debate. But what they have to recognize is that black water didn't happen because that was a company run by uniquely evil people, which employed uniquely evil people and didn't face any oversight. It happened for structural reasons to do with what PMCs are, to do with the way that they're contracted for, to do with the way that they hire their employees, which means that it's inevitable that private military contractors will treat their soldiers in far worse ways and will fight conflicts in far worse ways. Those are the two prongs of the extension that we're going to bring you a closing the up. Before that, I have two issues in rebuttal. Firstly, on whether there is a competitive market for private military contractors. And secondly, talking about what the alternative is if we stop using these military contractors. So, on this idea of a competitive market, there's really a lot of opening up hinges on what is a, a hopelessly naive idea. We want to say a few things here. Firstly, they tell us in the op leader speech that these like PMCs will compete on not killing civilians, and you'll hire the one that uh, that kills that kills the fewest civilians. Like it's odd that they simultaneously want to say, as they hinge much of their rhetorical case on, that the U.S. government and the U.S. military doesn't care about civilians, and so it just kills them. But that it will also hire on like on the proven record of PMCs of whether they kill civilians or not. They care much more, as we would tell you, about the size of the troop deployments that the company is able to provide. About the equipment that it has about its proven track record in fighting alongside US military forces. That brings me to the second response that we want to make here. There is no market for private military contractors in any sense of the sort of free market paradise that they want to talk about. They, I, they say that there's this new like PMC economy. I can name one PMC other than, than Blackwater. It's XC Services, which is actually Blackwater reformed after it was given a slap on the wrists by the US government and forced to change its name because of the scandal associated with the murders that it committed. Uh, the, the, with the murders that it committed 10 years ago. So we tell you that the military always <laughs> back, no thank you, to people that they have used before, people who have large resources. And there are just not that many contractors who can bring the, the size of troops and the number of support personnel that the US military are looking for. Because recognize, right, that the kinds of conflicts we use these people in are not like to fight as two thirds of the force in a, in a humanitarian interview. But when you are using basically the whole capacity of your army to invade a country like Iraq or Afghanistan, and you need extra troops, and so that's when you need large-scale deployments, and there are only a few companies that compete that can compete on that. So, no, they don't necessarily have to defend all the past actions of past private military contractors, but they have to recognize that the free market that they want to exist doesn't exist, and it's that kind of structural failing which causes the abuses that we want to talk about. 
Secondly, they're in trouble. Let's talk about what the alternative is here. Because there's a lot of talk about drone strikes. Look, drone strikes actually cause far fewer casualties than landing troops on the ground in the place in question. So, like, that highlights that this is not really the alternative that we're talking about in Spain. It's baffling for them to try to for them to try to push that on us. Because I, it's unclear whether they're like counter-propping, sending private military contractors into Yemen in place of the drone strikes that currently occur there. What they do, what soldiers do, as they recognize, we you send private military contractors into places where there are also soldiers. But what we tell you, what we're going to prove in our extension, is that they go where soldiers do, go, and do what soldiers do, but they do them in far worse ways, and that is problematic. Secondly, then, they want to push also on this like, idea of the alternative, that having private military contractors enable good interventions to happen. As they say, though, PMCs are only ever used alongside mass deployments of the rest of the army. That was quite an important like, structure of their case in terms of their attempt to defend oversight. So it's unclear how they can maintain that that actually happens. Um, yeah, let's do the extension now. Okay, so. Questions? No, thank you. We tell you firstly that private military contractors treat their soldiers in far worse ways than the US military does. Recognizing that the US military doesn't treat soldiers who fight for it in an especially good way, we tell you nonetheless that companies that are motivated by profit treat them in far worse ways. Well, why is that? Three ways. Firstly, we tell you that they often skimp on mental health provisions, even to a further extent than the US military does, because they don't face the kind of political pressure that the US government does to look after veterans who are a, like, greatly cared about political uh, political grouping, they don't have the incentive to invest in caring about their mental health provision. Secondly, we tell you they're likely to have far fewer support personnel because that, that is a way to skimp on costs while they can still provide frontline soldiers. Thirdly, we tell you they're not going to get good conflict-specific training. Even if they have very good levels of general training, they're not going to on a short rotation rather than this sort of two-year tour of duty that's more typical of the military. They're not going to take a month or two before that deployment to learn the language or learn about the details of the people they're fighting or the place they're fighting in. That means those soldiers are far more at risk because they don't understand the situation into which they're being put. Secondly, though, and more importantly, we tell you that these private military contractors actually fight conflicts in worse ways than regular soldiers. Uh, three things again here. Firstly, they're hiring. Oh, I mentioned that they hire ex-soldiers. Uh, ex what they don't mention is that they frequently hire soldiers who are dishonorably discharged from the US Army. They have far lower standards than the US Army does. Now, obviously, they don't want to mention that, but it is just the fact that these companies hire people who have a record of being able to fight, but don't have to stand up to the same sorts of moral examination as regular soldiers do. Secondly, uh, yeah, actually, go ahead. Actually, most of their recruitment comes from offering like poorly paid soldiers a good payday when they're potentially much more experienced. So they usually have a strong basis of soldiers to fight these conflicts. That's not true. It's factually untrue. And this is another thing that I, I want to flag out here. Um, because opening up wanted to talk quite a lot about effectiveness and having locally um, locally based forces. They simultaneously say that we're going to have a like, PMC formed of Pashto speakers and that we're hiring ex-US military soldiers who have all the training that comes with that. They cannot have both. And what we tell you actually is it is ex-soldiers. So what those ex-soldiers then do, secondly, is conduct their missions in far more damaging ways. Because if they're given a mission to take a piece of territory and they're doing that just for the sake of fulfilling their contractual obligation, they don't do that with an eye to the broader mission. So there were cases in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan where um, like colonels in the US Army ordered their troops not to fulfill a certain part of their mission, but to enter a city without drawing their weapons because they recognized that, that would be more conducive to the long term success of the mission, even if it put them at more risk in that short term. PMCs don't do that kind of thing. Thirdly, we tell you they're likely to have much less cultural sensitivity because they don't do this sorts of training, as I mentioned before. What that means is that you get soldiers. Um, who are far more likely to ferment, ferment resistance in the countries that they're fighting in, far more likely to spoil post-conflict settlement by uh, fermenting that kind of resistance, and just causing more debts because they are less likely to take risks to their own life and more likely to pursue blindly the contractual obligations that have been put, up, put upon them. This is not regulable when there are so few companies that can compete. And that is the structural conditions that create the monstrosities and the atrocities that have been committed by private military contractors in the past. Opbench can't run away from that. They have to own it, and that's why we propose. Questions? Yes.
We're going to talk about two things in this speech. Firstly, how Western pressure and Western engagement actually massively improves PMCs, not only raising their quality in these areas, but also in the other areas they're likely to fight in developing countries. And secondly, I'm going to talk some a uh, bit of chat about better as soldiers. Uh, than the normal army. Okay, so first thing with regards to like, accountability, uh, almost all rebuttal is integrated. A couple of outstanding responses to uh, in, in government. They sort of run this like patriotism better than profit motive. The thing is, patriotism often makes it a conflict of you versus them as individuals representing a nation. They're not just attacking you because you're fighting against them, they're attacking your personhood to some extent. They're attacking your nation, making massive threats to you. That's the kind of environment where you demean the opposition far more. You have to view them as evil and wrong because they are attacking you and your family in a way that you just wouldn't if you'd just been paid there for some reason. That means you're far more likely to engage in things like war crimes or to mistreat the population overall. Secondly, um, they ran this like PMCs will perpetuate the conflict. Most soldiers don't want to perpetuate the conflicts they're in, but also PMCs, and this is the big thing for like Gulf Bench. They usually don't do that much frontline fighting. They do things like guarding convoys and that kind of thing. When, as Fellow says, you're in uh, full invasion and that kind of thing. Firstly, that means they don't do that much terrible things. But also, these are the areas that make any invasion or military operation actually work. But the army's going most likely to cut, right? Because you're in a peacetime, you're not going to cut tanks because everyone knows they're important. Like working on, you know, transport systems seems a really odd thing to do. So there's never going to be the democratic pressure to keep that. But those are the kind of things that allow any insurgency fighting to occur, but also mean you actually are able to deliver things like benefit systems. And a failing military intervention that happens when you don't have good logistical support hurts more civilians because it drags on longer, so there is likely more opportunities for collateral damage. But also, when a conflict is going worse, the army have an incentive to fight it in worse ways, more aggressive tactics, target the individuals far more. Therefore, dragging it on is actually an incredibly bad thing. Okay, so accountability. So, the thing is, one of the probably most crucial ways of having any accountability is having soldiers come forward, maybe as whistleblowers, but also things like um, witnesses and that kind of thing to account for any crimes or issues that have done, but also to speak out if they're asked about policy and those kind of actions and what it was like interviewing like ex-soldiers about how terribly the army ran these things or how well is crucial for understanding where interventions fell. It's one of the few ways we have of improving the army overall with this kind of information. Because you're not going to get it from other people whose conflict Zones, there's a lack of information, there's often a lack of journalists because they just can't be everywhere. Also, it's dangerous to go to certain areas. Therefore, the only place you can really get it is from people coming forward. The thing is, it's much harder to come forward when you're part of the military. A couple of reasons for this. Firstly, the concept of duty that you're massively embedded into. Moreover, that's the thing OG wants to stand by, this like real patriotism and group loyalty that makes it a betrayal, not just a, it doesn't mean you're just coming out against it. You're betraying your fellow troops, your fellow soldiers, in a way you just aren't when you're in a PMC and it is a contract-based arrangement you have. That makes it far harder to come forward. Secondly, being dishonorably discharged from the army is a much greater threat to you than it is ever to be discharged by a company because people see firings in companies all the time, whereas the army is a much more respected unit. It kills any future plans you have, much of your future career options. That's terrible for you as an individual, so it's massively stacked cost. Thirdly, the massively hierarchical nature of the army means they just have a lot of power over your life to control you and tell you what to do. And that means it's very hard to criticise them overall. This is potentially the most important thing, whereas PMC soldiers can come out and speak on these kind of things and criticise it. Moreover, the governments, Western governments, have the ability to pressure PMCs, a couple of, uh, and also the desire to. Why is this? Firstly, because associating yourself with a bad reputation of PMCs who hurt lots of people, that's the kind of thing that provokes more insurgency and responses if they have a reputation for human rights, but also gets you massive amounts of criticism from the media, which makes fighting any war much harder. And therefore encumbers any ethic you have. So the armies do have uh, quite a lot of level of interest in that kind of thing. Or if it's bad for like troop morale, if you have just some really outrageous PMCs in there that disrupts the soldiers. Moreover, you're just not going to pay them if they're substandard quality. Fergus's only response to this is just to go, oh, there's not a competitive market. First reason, I can only name one company. That's probably just because you don't know a lot about these kind of things. Very few people <laughs> have spec knowledge on PMCs. So, 
there are a lot more. But also, he says, you just don't have enough people who can provide a large number of things. The thing is, PMCs can often provide specific services and those kind of things, specific kinds of soldiers, or can provide the extra help on certain convoys. That's not a massive uh, human element uh, demand for each one, but also means you can have smaller ones that augment very certain sets of the army, so they can survive. That means there is some level of competitive market for this kind of things. Moreover, there are a large number of ex-soldiers who you could potentially recruit in those kind of things, and it is incredibly profitable. Therefore, there is some level of competitive market pressure to place on these kind of things. Moreover, there's an obvious competition. It's called the army recruiting more people. They are an obvious competitor to this kind of thing, so you're not going to hire them you're going to use the army more if PMCs are that bad. You can actually press with this. Before I explain this point further, I'll take closing. Or I mean, the whole place is contingent on Axel actually listening to these whistleblowers. But you haven't explained why the PMC, why PMCs will listen to them as opposed to the army, which already have this inbuilt mechanism. Yeah, when a whistleblower comes out to the media and everyone gets really outraged by this, they'll pressure the army. The army won't hire that PMC anymore. That PMC suffers a lot. Therefore, they'll change their behaviour. Kind of simple, really. Okay, why does uh, changing this matter? Firstly, just them fighting better is useful, but also having extra troops to make any of the Western wars work is helpful. But also, they're going to be working in developing nations anyway. Developing nations often have a strong incentive to hire PMCs because they have potentially better technology, more experienced troops, but also they often don't want to train up that strong local armies that could potentially be a threat to their power, could rebel, and those kind of things. And the thing is, when you then have better behaviour in those kind of things, it limits the casualties and damage to all these other areas, and they're going to carry it across because once you set up systems for better behaviour, you're going to enforce them across all areas, but also they don't want the PR thing that will damage their chances with the West from actions they do in developing nations. That is massively important in seizing massive reduction in most kinds of uh, damage. Okay, better than uh, soldiers. Firstly, uh, they're often like at the more at the end of their career, and paid soldiers is terrible. It's likely to be much higher in PMCs. We can get that. Secondly, we can demand that PMCs do regulate the mental health of their thing. We can make those uh, requests. Thirdly, uh, they often take time to learn these kind of things. Otherwise, they'd just be bad soldiers in this kind of thing. And PMCs have the incentive to sell them as really effective. So you're going to train them to a large degree. All these reasons, I beg you to oppose. Okay, in this speech, I'm going to get two points of clash. Firstly, the nature of PMCs. Hint, this is about uh, a profit incentive, why folks is the only person to debate to understand that. Secondly, the effect of the nature of that uh, those PMCs has on the war. First, quite a lot of rebuttal, five points, one from OG, uh, one from OO, four from CO. So I want to tell us that are, oh, but if they don't if they aren't employed by the West, these, these people will just go elsewhere. No, no, no. Most of these used by, by developing countries are entirely different organizations. They cannot afford Blackwater, these are totally different companies. It's not proper Haram mercenaries, like different type of people. Uh, obviously not. If the West stopped hiring them, the people with the money could actually afford them, they would disappear. Closing off, uh, from closing opposition. Firstly, uh, quite flippantly, they're like, oh, they just used to guard convoys. Actually, when guarding convoys, as, pro as proved by Blackwater, you can kill quite a lot of people, but guess what? When guarding it, people walk by, and if you think they're a little bit threatening, you can shoot them. And if anyone asks you afterwards, they're like, oh, it looked a bit like they had a gun. Secondly, and um, uh, more substantially, they're like, it's harder to come forward. Uh, yeah, in the army because uh, of shame. Two things. One, notice that public pressure, as Fergus told you, leads to reporting mechanisms being instituted in the US army. That's why there were whistleblowers at Abu Ghraib who were protected in the aftermath of that because the public could see them. That's not true of private companies. Private companies are much more easily able to cover stuff up because those mechanisms can't be uh, enforced. I'll, I'll explain why it's hard to regulate later. The third thing they said is that, ah, oh, uh, developing countries will adopt this standard. I mean, I mean, I mean that's just a contingent point on whether you think that PMCs are better than that. So that's like a marginal benefit they get if they're right, they're not right, that's what the debate's about. The fourth thing they said was that, ah, oh, uh, we can just regulate away all the problems that folks talked about. A few things here. 
When they're in conflict, you can't just send them home. When they're involved in important missions, that's not an option you have. So you can't regulate them in that way. You might be able to like find them, but quite often those are extremely soft finds. And ultimately, in a court, it's very hard to prove that someone uh, killed someone illegitimately when the burden of proof is against you. So there's really not much you can do. Notice also, whether they can do this for mental health, as soon as they leave your employ, you have no control over their standards again. The thing about the US Army is as soon as something happens, you can institute standards that last forever. It's, 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 it's an organization with a history that, that can be studied. As soon as these contractors aren't used anymore, they just go back to their old ways, ready to be renamed and rehired, as Fergus told you. That's why a group response of let's regulate the law was never acceptable in this debate. Firstly, the nature of PMC. What did we get from Bowen? They were like, ah, oh, the thing about PMC is that there's no chess beating nationalism, therefore they're more accountable. This is really bizarre, because in the aftermath of Andrew Gray, what people were so shocked by was that US soldiers, US soldiers representing the homeland, who commit atrocity that were that bad. There was actually a huge incentive for because of this sort of duty not to do those sort of things. In comparison, when it's a private company, it's much easier to blame individual people. Oh, they went rogue. It's, it's just this company that was wrong, let's use this, rather than a bit more structural problems within the US Army. Because of all the points of regulation, that's what forces you to change the structure of the army, rather than just rehiring another PMC, turning a blind eye. Then they were like, ah, oh, no, no, no. The great thing about PMCs is you expect knowledge. This is bizarre because there's a profit incentive. You cut the cost. The things you don't do is put people in, in, into training, into language training, that is time not spent fighting because you, you only get paid for the fighting there. Or the headcount, even more bizarrely from OO, it sounds like a terrible mechanism to ensure that they kill more people. Then, uh, I, I've already talked about the thing about enforcement, you can't send them home. OG, OG rightly uh, pointed out these people are not taught in the same way as US soldiers. Fergus ex explains why this is unique to the actual structural nature of the PMC. He, he tells you three things about how they treat their soldiers well. Firstly, mental health, fewer support personnel because those cost um, money. Notice that the US Army is a huge amount of political capital to fund its own army. That means that it, it, it can afford all, the, all those extra things. No, no response to that kind of public, uh, pressure. Um, no response to any of that. The only thing that we heard in response are this is a competitive market. Look, the point is, is these companies have incredibly high startup costs. You have to have like tons of incredibly expensive military. What that means is, at best, there will be a few of them. Well, they are, they don't challenge each other's standards. They broadly go about their business in the same way. Notice that Black Country is renamed and rehired by the US Army even after the terrible atrocities it committed. That shows you that that is literal evidence that the competitive market does not work. You can't just be like market solves something, because that's not enough of this debate. Uh, I'll take closing. PMCs need to be as effective as possible to gain their support. But they're effective in things that the army wouldn't fund but are crucial in their success, like the driving the convoys, that means less civilian suffering here. Two things. One, the army would obviously pay to uh, have people drive convoy, uh, protect convoys if necessary to the mission. The second thing is, it depends what you mean by effectiveness, right? Because often it is way cheaper not to have all the support mechanisms we're talking about. Often it is cheaper just to go in and, and kill the 10 people and kind of hope the person you're going for is, is one of them. That doesn't really cost you anything. What does cost you stuff is having the cultural training beforehand, hiring experts to ensure that you don't just go in all guns blazing. The thing about PMCs, right, is that is, is that actually because it is cheaper to do those terrible things? That's why I'm going to talk about the consequences of war. Only opposition is like, oh, this is good because people value PMC troops less and therefore are happy to see them killed so it doesn't incur all political costs. Firstly, like, one, it's unclear whether the US public doesn't get to decide the length of the war. If they think that the, the, the people being killed is, is too many, that, that should be a good reason to end that war. That's how democracy works. Second thing that's important here is the. This is precisely the problem with less oversight. The public are less interested in the conduct of PMCs. They can see that in their case. That's the big problem for them that they don't recognize. Fergus told you three things here, which basically got, got no, no response, apart from one minor thing. First, he said there were lower standards of hiring. And they were like, no, they hire people because, because they can pay them more. People who join the US Army, it is not a particularly well-paid job. And the point, the reason people join is a sense of duty. People who join to be to be mercenaries, to fight for different sides, don't have that sense of duty in built. That's what open government told you. More importantly, what these companies do is they want aggressive people. They want people who uh, will go in and do the, the kind of uh, missions that Fergus outlined that PMCs are more likely to do. That's why you hire people with dishonorable di discharges, because they're a little bit too violent in the circumstances for the US Army, but they're great for Blackwater who enjoy that kind of thing. The second thing is they conduct worst, uh, worst missions. The reason here is they have no eye for the overall 
mission. They don't care about the post-conflict uh, situation in Iraq in, in 2003, because that's not their problem. Any commander within the, the US Army has to be thinking about those things. It's part of their job. It's not part of the job of black people. As long as they get the thing that they're asked to do to, uh, done, they can stretch that all the way up to the contract, and they'll still do that. The third thing is that they're just less culturally intense. They don't have the kind of training and the kind of stuff Fergus talked about, and that's why they're so much worse in these conflict situations. That's why I'm so proud of Fergus. <laughs> Okay. Two points of clash in your speech. We're going to talk primarily about how this works in the West, particularly with London accountability. We're also going to talk about the effects this is going to have when you're in the developing world, employing PMCs rather than the West and the developing world, and when both of them we think that's a key area. Three points of extraneous rebuttal before we get that. So, the first thing we got in the last week was the idea that PMCs avoid structural reform because govs can just hire another one when they commit abuses and they can just put it onto the only blame on like some bad apples. So we say first of like bad apple abuses are probably used much more by governments regarding their own troops because it's probably quite politically toxic in general to um, say that like accepting your entire system of the army is actually something that needs a deep amount of overhaul. That's not mean it's not likely to be politically popular, especially given the army is held in quite high regard in general. So like trying to say that like there's a system after the whole army tends to be quite unpopular. PMCs by contrast tend to have like quite good incentives to reform what they think these Kinds of atrocity and try and like weed those kinds of people out because they're not likely to be hired. You also like contradict your own case in making that point, given you've said there isn't a competitive market, which means they probably wouldn't be able to hire those additional companies if you were right about that. But like we probably don't think about our second point. They say that they have no cultural training. So probably like true to some extent in the US Army anyway. We also say like the US military can like put in specific demands that like have cultural training of PMCs. We think that like as the US like as Western militaries like grow in the specific but there's specific demand. We say the PMC is going to fulfill specialised niches in cultural areas. We think that, like, in just saying that like, they don't have cultural training isn't necessarily going to be the case when they have strong incentives to develop that cultural kind of cultural training in order to be hired. And like, the idea that, like, the PMCs are going to have no care for border mission. Right, so guys, like, the Western government still control the armies in these cases, and they still control the broad plan, okay? Like, does an individual soldier on the crown necessarily have an idea of, like, what the broader mission is when they're actually completing their role? We say, probably not. They're probably, like, following the orders of, their, of the commanding officer. Like, these are literally people who we hire not to create big plan, but to perform individual roles on the ground. So we think that, like, PMCs, when they can do those things, like, provide support to convoy, that doesn't necessarily matter, like, in, in, like whether, whether you have a broader mission or not, because we say when you're on the ground just doing your, doing your job and doing what you're ordered to do, that doesn't necessarily make a huge amount of impact. So, and um, like even if it's even if it's true, like that's a good reason to like use troops some of the like a lot of the time we're not ex uh, advertising exclusive use of PMCs, but we think they can fill those niche roles as Bramble told you in his speech. Accountability in the West. So opening governments say that PMCs have incentives to create wars going and lack of government accountability. So like this incentive is somewhat similar to the incentive mechanics have not to fix your car properly. So you'll come back to them to get more work. We say that, like, though this isn't an incentive that's generally happens upon, because the competition is still itself. So CMG wants to say that, like, this competition doesn't exist. So, like, mostly they just, like, kind of just asserted this. But, like, let's take them at their best. Even if they're right, the competition doesn't exist so much with other PMC. And at the very least, does exist between, like, when the fact you can actually hire to build more money, the money you're going to spend on the PMC, into actually training up more of your troops that at least provide some competition, even if they were just one PMC. You can also probably like get like other countries to assist you in those kinds of things as well. That means like you at least have like some kind of competition that's effective in the, this kind of situation. But like we're skeptical that there is no competition given like it probably doesn't cost a huge amount to hire people and send them on the ground. We think that like that market has probably been expanding a lot in the past few years as opening opposition has said. So what do we think is the most important thing regarding accountability? We think the most important thing is fundamentally about whistleblowing. 
Okay? So you can think of that's important because that's fundamentally the main way you actually get information off the ground um, in the kind of conflict zones where atrocities commit. Either because, like, your own government tries to keep, like, because the main source of info is usually journalists, but journalists usually find it very hard to get in for two reasons. Firstly, because, like, governments often just try and keep them out because, like, wars are messy and, like, often leads to things that would cause a lot of scandals, so you can't keep journalists out. Secondly, journalists often just don't want to go there because, like, huge numbers of them have been dying in the Middle East because uh, through um, attacks from the groups there. So we say that, like, whistleblowing is your key source of information, which is what opening opposition missed when they were talking yeah. about, like, these accountability issues. Because it's not true, it's, it, it might be true that, like, the US military gets the benefits of the doubt sometimes, but people can't always tell the difference, and we still don't get the kind of information about this unless you have some kind of whistleblowing. Why is whistleblowing easier though? Whistleblowing is easier because like when you're whistleblowing to a private military co contractor, for one thing, like you don't necessarily you don't have to worry about facing accusation of treason, for example, when like you're actually whistleblowing like things which are often like trying to be kept as public secrets. Like governments don't have capital centers to do that. Instead, you're much more likely to face things like look, civil lawsuits when you've spoken your contract. We say those like comparatively are probably like less scary to people than actually being sued for treason, losing all your stuff, and also going to prison for several years. We also say like Advocacy groups of like those like civil rights organizations, particularly in the US, often have like quite a lot of money and are able to afford a lot of the legal fees that like might be incurred if you were fighting a civil case um, in that kind of situation. So we say that means like you get much more you get to get like more accountability through whistleblowing on these kinds of companies. So CG say that like PMCs hire dishonorably charged soldiers who behave worse. Like they basically just like said this was true. We could like plausible reasons why it's not true, okay, given like we say there like, aren't necessarily a huge number of the Solomon charge soldiers, and they're probably not, not the only people you can necessarily hire, because you could probably like hire people from the US military whose contracts have expired, who want a better pay, and you think are, are up to the job. Secondly, like, it's obviously like quite bad for your reputation as a PMC, particularly when you're like trying to sell your services to the government, when like you've hired a bunch of these people. So even if these practices have happened in like earlier days of PMCs, we say they're much less or less likely to happen in the long run. I'll take close. There yeah, have been a lot in the middle because there are mechanisms for that and their sense of duty drives them to do. It just doesn't happen from private military contractors. There haven't been any whistleblowers, all your nice talk aside. Well, there obviously like have been whistleblowers in investigations in terms of like the fact that you guys can actually list a load of atrocities that private military contractors have actually committed. That means the information actually does come out to some extent. That information is probably the largest more likely to share that information. We say it's probably the case, I mean I can't be certain, but it's probably the case that there are probably a lot of atrocities that were committed by US soldiers that we probably don't know about because the whistleblowing was less likely to happen because of the reasons we gave you. So the developing world. We say that like there's a strong demand for PMCs in the developing world to attack an expertise. They're not just like different companies necessarily, because even if that's the case of the status quo, it's going to be the case that those companies are probably not going to just suddenly want to go bankrupt, but also like have expertise that countries like China and India want and can afford because they're spending a lot of money on uh, information that provides more technology. We say Western governments have like much stronger incentives to moderate PMCs because they have like stronger free presses which involves a scandal, but people often care much more less in the developing world because like you have to look after your own welfare because it's much worse. So West help keep accountability. Of these. If you just have developing nations do it, that means that like people are much less more likely to misbehave. So we say that like the accountability improved because Western nations are not going to want to be seen to be associated with a pirate committed company that is performing atrocities when working for developing nations army. That incentive completely goes away, which means that developing the PMCs of developing nations behave much worse. That's bad. We are proud to oppose.